Don't cancel that. We need it. Okay, so um, you're of course only just starting these two exercises, but the two exercises, although very literally being carried out by pen and paper, are in fact algorithmic design <coughs> exercises. So they're rule-based ways of making marks on paper, and because of the rules, a whole series of different characters of lines that would be otherwise be possible are disallowed, right? So you voluntarily, by following the rules, give up the possibility of drawing a very wiggly line, a very sharp line, all of those sorts of things. And when you get a chance, once we've um, played a few games, if you put all of those racing car games out on a table, what you'll see is, of course, they'll all be unique because they all have different underlying race courses, but at the same time, they will share a huge amount of their character, the specific types of curvature, all sorts of things. There will be some that are somewhat unique within the field. I just saw, I can't remember, it was one of you two, who'd had a strategy where they really crashed into the walls all the time. So that meant you had a sort of bounce with a kink, which would otherwise not happen. So that rule already has an impact uh, on the character of possibilities. And especially if we deleted the racetracks, you would still, in a sense, know what the racetrack must have been somewhat like because the evidence of that environment is in the trace itself. Uh, so now, of course, you're expecting, and you're absolutely right, that we're going to get onto the computer in order to do the next phase of the code module. Uh, we know that you haven't learnt code, and we know there's too many of you and not quite enough time to fully teach you everything about writing code. That's okay because what we really want to teach you, like in all of our modules, is a style of thinking that, again, like the curves, gives up certain things but embraces others. Uh, and eventually in your design careers you'll figure out which of these styles of thinking work well for you, which of them work well with each other in order to kind of get experience across all those mediums uh, and to see what benefit they bring. Code in particular brings the huge benefit that it's incredibly explicit, meaning if something is not genuinely an input and you haven't genuinely encoded what to do with that input, you won't get any output at all. Nothing happens without you, or in this case without somebody else's code, uh, doing some work for you. Uh, and it's never a mystery, uh, or at least nothing gets invented along the way. It all has to be encoded for it to happen. So for you guys, you're going to get from UTS Online a series of files. One is an environment file that's formatted in a way that you cannot interact with it directly, but the code reads that and can ask questions of it. So it's a little bit like an invisible racing car track. We can ask if we've crashed, or in this case we can ask how high the terrain is at the point that we sample, but we won't see it directly unless we make marks ourselves which slowly reveal its qualities, so it will come into focus. It is a landscape, it's a real landscape, uh, and you will sl so slowly learn more about its characteristics. Uh, there's a base file. There's nothing special about that file at all. It's just a rectangle of the right size, so you know where to try to draw, that lines up with the sampled environment. And then there's two Python codes, ones with .py, the Walker code, that's the one you're going to interact with. And then the Walker module, that's where uh, myself and Matt Austin have pre-programmed a bunch of behaviors for your Walker. It's open source, you can get in there and have a look, uh, but you probably won't end up changing anything in that code. Uh, also, that means that if we make updates to that code, it won't get in the way of anything you've changed. So there's a bit of separation that helps you keep on top of your file management but also it means you don't get scared by a thousand lines of code that you don't know what it means. You can just hide that one. If you're interested, dig in and have a look, but it's not necessary. What is important, very minimal constraint, but a super important one, all those files must be in one folder on your computer. That's all, don't break them up. If you make a saved copy, you need to save all of them together. Okay, in Rhino, I think you've all used Rhino to greater or lesser extents by now, but you should at least uh, recognize the interface. 
There is a command called edit Python script. And of course, in Rhino, it will autocomplete. So if you sort of remember that, it will fill in the rest. There's no other commands that are very similar. That opens up a code editor where at some point in the future, if you get excited by this exercise or others, is where you will write your own code. Uh, in this case, we just open two codes. Uh, the module, again, the one that you can look at if you want to, but that for the most part does things for you. And then the Walker code, which is the one you really do interact with. Scrolling up and down, you can see it's not super long. Uh, bits of code you can even hide from yourself with the little collapsing thing. It's only the main that you need to interact with. You definitely shouldn't touch the setup. Uh, and then you'll see a whole bunch of green code. Anything that's in green, the reason it's green is the little hash key basically tells the Python interpreter, the code, the computer code reader, to ignore it. So what's the point of it? It's there for you or for me or for whoever's written the code or reading the code to explain what's going on. I've tried to, I haven't been 100% consistent, but I've tried to have in English what's about to happen and then the black, blue and red parts of the text, that's the actual code. That's what the computer reads. Python is quite readable, so you, you'll see that often the words are very relatively similar. One's of course a lot more compact, uh, but you can sort of see what's going on. And I tend to use very long variable names so that it's readable. You can sort of see what's going on. Uh, in principle, the first thing that happens is you get asked two questions to pick a bunch of lines. That's kind of the equivalent of all of you choosing your start points in the racing car game. Unlike the racing car game where it's assumed you went zero and zero in the previous move, in this one, you get the chance to define a direction and a length. So each line sets, imagine the previous velocity of that drawer, the walker or the car, however you want to think of it. So if you draw a very long line, it's going very fast. When you draw, the first point you click is the start. The last point is the end, so it's driving in that direction from start to end. You'll see in a second. You can, I recommend strongly that you start by picking one line and seeing what that does before you pick 100. It will also make it faster for you and you try to get a sense of what's going on. So try to be a bit of a scientific reductionist, change one variable at a time, try to see what that change did before then changing other things and slowly build up all the mixes. The second question is an important one. How many iterations? You all know about iterations. I always ask for more than you want to do. Uh, in this case, you can ask the computer to do as many as you want. Of course, it dramatically changes the time and how long it will cycle for. If you ask for a thousand, it will take a while. If you've also picked a thousand lines, uh, you can imagine it adds up very quickly. When you get down in here, structurally, Whenever there's an indent, or at least in this code, the two places that there are indents, that defines the major loops or the cycles. So in a game of racing cars, the loops are once each for all the players to play. In our case, that's the inner loop, which it says for walker in the walker population list. So one at a time, the walker gets a turn, just like you taking your racing car turns. And then the outer loop, decides how many turns everybody gets in the whole game. Within that, we, you get to define what the hell a turn means. So in racing car, it means decide how to change your momentum and play out your move, decide your next location and draw the line, right? So make some query, make a decision, and then enact that decision on the paper. You can see we have left a whole bunch of possible things written here. Almost all of them are turned off. That's how you will start with very few functions turned on. You'll see what they do, and then you'll slowly turn more on and modify them. That's the primary task is for you to decide which things you need to have on and which ones off and how to change the relevant variables. You can write your own small functions and it will change things. Uh, but it's not entirely necessary. Right now, if I don't do anything, in fact, I'm going to even turn off slightly more. Uh, you can see 
it asks if the walker is dead. If the walker gets outside of the boundaries, we kill him. So it um, saves computational time. And if a walker gets stuck in a hole and can't get out, we also kill them. Uh, so the first question is, is the walker still alive? You don't come back to life, unlike racing cars. It's not a good strategy to die in this one, or to crash. And then if you are alive, the first thing in this case that you do, and probably will always be the case, is you query the background and you find out what the current height is. So wherever you are, how high are you? We've collapsed. It's a real landscape that we've had scanned. James Melson, uh, if any of you have interacted with him yet, has performed the scan for us. And the height is set so that zero is the lowest thing possible and one is the highest thing possible. That's to make life easy for you mathematically. Uh, in this case, the first thing I do then with that value, which must be somewhere between zero and one, I don't know what it is, is I multiply it by five and I use that to set the line weight of my drawer. So if I'm higher, I've got a thicker line. If I'm lower, I've got a thinner line. Then I move. And just to show you, if that's all I'll do, I'll, see, I'll show you what happens. <coughs> will be amazingly anticlimactic. I go pick one of my lines, or more of, if you want, and I say 100 moves. It takes not very long. In this case, one line 100. And if I go and have a look, seemingly nothing has happened. All those lines are already there. That's because I didn't do anything that leaves a mark. Right? It would be like you calculating all your moves but never drawing the racing car or his track. So we have a function called walker draw. That probably should be called draw trail to be more explicit because there are other versions of draw. So if I now turn that on by deleting the hash so it's no longer green, maybe I'll pick a couple, walk a bit further. Takes a tiny bit longer but it's not too bad. So there you see, so now you, I've got a whole bunch of guys walking parallel, they're not doing any turning. All they're doing is changing the thickness when they go over something higher. And you can give a sense how certain types of drawings start to subtly reveal the underlying landscape. Not super exciting, but that's your job, not mine. If I go back and say, okay, well there's another thing, it's called walk down. I want this thing to start oops, turning, I can make it bend towards the lowest point, wherever it is. It checks just its immediate neighbors, and of the immediate neighbors, whichever's the lowest it goes to. The danger and the reason we have to kill them is if they get into a little tiny hole, then they always just choose the same place. I'm going to the lowest, I'm going to the lowest, I'm going to the lowest, and there's not much point drawing again and again on top of yourself. Now I'll pick a few more lines. Okay, so, ah yeah, interesting. Eventually you get an error, we'll, we'll stop that. These pink, when it comes up pink, something went wrong. In this case it said it was unable to add the line to the document. So for sure what happened is it tried to draw a line with a zero length for whatever reason. Probably it got in a hole, we didn't kill it fast enough and he drew while sitting still. We will modify the code so that that doesn't happen. The nature of what we're doing, where you guys mix and match, there will for sure be things that you can do that break it. It's not 100% foolproof. So just let us know. Try to guess or send a screen grab of exactly what you've tried to do, and then we will update the code for everyone to fix those things. Uh, and especially on Tuesday, then we will be floating around. You'll be talking to your tutors about the outcome, but Matt, myself, and maybe one or two others will come and fix any problems, and we'll try wherever possible to actually update the code base so that everyone gets any, the benefit of any changes. Uh, but even though it failed, it did draw for a while before it failed, so then you can start to see how, of course, that I started them on very straight lines really impacts the character of this thing, the heaviness of the lines, as I get heavy, you start to get a sense that down in this corner is a higher mountain. Up here there's a higher mountain. Some kind of valley in the middle, indicated by the thin lines. 
Now it's pretty scraggly of course. I would say this one kind of is an unhappy medium of you sort of reveal the landscape but not much. You sort of reveal the turning of going downhill but not much. And then you quite strongly reveal the input lines. So I would say this would be a fairly average to low, maybe very bad output in terms of what we're looking for. We're going to try that you do things that reveal the landscape to some extent, that reveal the walker logic to some extent, uh, and that make something compelling and beautiful. Right? So it's somewhere between a, a map and an artwork <coughs> and so forth. Uh, there are other abilities already. We're going to add a whole bunch of color based things that we will launch for you on Tuesday. We're trying to keep it a bit constrained in the beginning, a bit like that. You can even draw quite beautiful things only with the racing car game. For sure you can draw beautiful things just with the code that you have. And it's better to dig in and try to play with things. Uh, and then we'll give you more. Uh, but for example, you can also add a circle instead of drawing your trail. So every time you go, you drop down a circle. And in this case, I'm saying the circle is radius is four times the height. Maybe I'll even go harder and say it's 10 times the height. That's a very easy one to understand when you want to change certain things, just the straight constants. I'm sure someone will go in a hole again, but oh, maybe it's okay with the circles. I'll go for gold. Okay, it takes a bit longer with all these lines and 500 cycles. Great. So then you can start to see now it's slightly more subtle in its character. The circle sizes are to do with the height of the mountain and we can sort of start to see. It's a, actually a very featured landscape. Uh, so you can go quite fine and there's enough resolution and detail there for you to respond to. Um, they're supposed to, but because they have momentum, sometimes they get a bit across before they're killed. Um, but yeah, that's a very good question. If you hit the boundary at speed, you break through before they shoot you from the watchtower. Great. So that's real geometry in Rhino. It's a very good question. So you then should print that and bring it in. And in fact, you should bring a series of prints on Tuesday ready to talk to your tutors. It's quite conscious and great that most of your tutors don't know how to code. It's inappropriate to ask them code questions. That's not their job. Their job is to discuss what you've managed to create, for you to reveal what you understand about its logic and the decisions you've made, to talk, of course, like you would any design project, the things you would like to do better, the things that you currently think are working well, and so forth. Remember, you're talking about this as somewhere between a map and an artwork. It's supposed to be beautiful, but it somehow should carry and extract some of the character of the landscape beneath it, uh, and so forth. Uh, definitely bring uh, printouts. The final submission of this module is also exactly like this. It's an artwork. It really is. You'll get more sophisticated and we'll give you slightly more uh, functionality with the code, but that is what you're drawing. Um, and you'll do a color print somewhere around the scale of A2. We're figuring out exactly what will work with our exhibition strategy, um, but that's what you're doing. So between now and Tuesday, it's important that you work with the code, get it to make a lot of things, make something that you're proud of, and try to understand a little bit what you've done. Um, we don't, for a second, believe that you'll be able to write the equivalent of this code at the end of the module, maybe not even write anything. The person who gets the highest grade may not have actually written any code or just changed, had very good strategies around that, how they use it. Um, also, I never believe that code will do everything. I obviously do use code in my own architecture. It's clearly not necessary to use code to make architecture, or at least not your own. Uh, I definitely believe that it can be a, a relay race. You're going to do some work to create the initial state. Where do they all start from? That will have a huge consequence on the character. So you should see that as a creative act. Where do you put the walkers? Where do you start them? Which way do you point them? Are there more in one area and not in another? In what angles do they all start? 
but also the code output you can then work on as well. You can, for example, if you run the code multiple times, maybe sometimes they run downhill and sometimes they run uphill, you can then take that output, put it on different layers, change their color, do other manipulations. You can even print it out and draw by hand things, coloring in, changing the density, doing stuff that you don't know how to code but you think the artwork should have, right? But the same rules or I guess guidelines apply. We want you to enhance the character and reveal the landscape, not obliterate it. We also want you to enhance the character of the algorithm and the output of the code, not obliterate it. So I don't want to see just someone who's painted the Mona Lisa and it, I can't tell that there was a landscape or that there was a code. I, hopefully you can find a way that they all uh, make each other better. So does it mean the landscape is the same for everyone? Uh, the current landscape that you start with between now and Tuesday is the same for everyone. After that we're going to give every single person a unique landscape. Uh, the input lines can be any curve, but it's only going to pay attention to the start and the end. So drawing a curvy start line won't change, won't be any better than if you draw a straight one. Um, you can just use lines, yep. yep. There are some other methods that are turn left or turn right. I heard a really good podcast the other day making people imagine themselves, close their eyes and imagine changing lanes in your car. And most people do this. And of course what that would do is drive you into the side of the road. What you actually do when you change lanes is turn into the lane, turn back to go straight while you're crossing the lane, and then turn again to return to your original straight path. There's three turns to get where you are. You've got to change the wheel and bring it back to straight or else you'll keep going around a corner or you will have hit the wall. You could also, within your move, if you wanted to make a wiggler, you could turn left, turn right, and then draw those two paths and turn left again, you'd be going back where you started. Otherwise, if you just turn once, or if you um, turn in ways that don't bring you back to the start, you'll end up going in a circle, which is totally fair game. Um, and of course, all of the methods, let me show you just quickly how to interact with that. Uh, so here I have a turn, for example, and if I turn my draw back on, so you can draw the trail and circles as well if you want. So I'm going to turn, in this case, it's a little bit confusing, but minus 50 times the height, 